So good morning, and uh, of course, let me add my uh, <coughs> thank you to Andrea and the team. This is a this is a truly amazing thing and portent of things to come. I hope. So I'm I'm going to talk about uh, far ultraviolet C light, uh, which we hope is going to prevent the airborne transmission of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but also all other viruses. It's not specific to uh, SARS-CoV-2. So we know that one of the main transmission modes for, for COVID-19 is, is airborne transmission, uh, as well as uh, touching. Um, and the airborne car uh, carrier particles have a, quite a big range in size. The big ones are uh, microns in size, small ones are submicrons. And uh, I hope you can see a, a, a simulation from uh, KIT in Japan, uh, somebody sneezing. And the larger particles, which are the blue and the, and the green particles, uh, within uh, a minute or so are falling to the ground. But the smaller particles, the, the aerosols, uh, are not. So here's, here's the same simulation, just looking at the smaller particles and over a time scale of, uh, of a few minutes here. Uh, and you can see over uh, what will be 20 minutes, I think, uh, the smaller particles are still in the air. And importantly, what we now know is that uh, there have been some good studies of the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus stability, uh, which finds viability in these aerosols for, for several hours. So these, uh, these aerosols potentially have viable um, uh, virus in them. So, the question uh, we, we have is how can we inactivate these airborne viruses uh, in, in occupied spaces, like in the last uh, um, picture. Um, and let me start by saying that we actually know um, how to kill uh, every possible kind of uh, microbe, bacteria, viruses. And that's with ultraviolet light, and we've known that for more than 100 years. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's used broadly. Uh, here's, here's an operating uh, room uh, which is being uh, decontaminated overnight with uh, conventional germicidal ultraviolet light. But what you might notice from this picture is that there's nobody in it and that's the issue with conventional uh, germicidal UV that uh, it's, uh, it's a health hazard. It uh, causes skin cancer, causes eye diseases. So while you can use it when people aren't around uh, you can't realistically use it in, in uh, populated locations. So uh, working from that as our basis, we uh, started to think about far UVC light and, and specifically that's at the far end of the ultraviolet spectrum uh, illustrated here. And it's around two, two, uh, 220 nanometers uh, in, uh, in terms of wavelength. Um, and what happens in that region is that there is a large protein resonance around there. And what that means is that uh, light of these wavelengths has very limited penetration in, in biological materials. It gets absorbed very quickly uh, in, in any sort of protein or, or similar molecules. So what does that mean? Well, I've, this is a little simulation. So here, here's, the, uh, here's our skin here, uh, right at the top got the stratum corneum and below the squamous cells and the uh, basal cells and the melanocytes. So, and here's my notion of what uh, microbes look like in, above in the air. So with conventional germicidal UV, I mean, what happens is because the UV uh, is very penetrating, well, it's killing the, it's killing the bugs, but it's also producing damage in uh, uh, the squamous cells and the uh, melanocytes. So, we know it causes squamous cell carcinoma. We know it causes uh, melanoma. But let's, let's contrast this with the situation with far UVC light, which uh, has a very short range, but certainly enough range to penetrate a, 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 a virus or a bacteria. So what, what you see is that uh, the far UVC light potentially can kill the uh, viruses and bacteria just the same way but it can't penetrate anywhere near the, the, uh, the stratum corneum, the dead cells and the surface of our skin. So it can't damage any of the healthy cells or the living cells, I should say, in, in our skin. And the same applies to the eye where we have a tear layer that has the same, does the same thing. 
So uh, that's encouraging that, uh, in, in principle at least, 5UVC light has the same germicidal properties as conventional UV, but is potentially safe. So the two questions uh, that we've been uh, asking ourselves are, first of all, most importantly, is it safe? And does it work? So in terms of safety studies, well, uh, we started with, uh, with um, uh, in, in vitro uh, laboratory studies. So we use skin, uh, human skin uh, models with a, a stratum corneum, an epidermis, and a dermis. And what we plot here is the two, the two conventional pre-malignant uh, assays that people in the UV world look at um, uh, and as a function of UV fluence both for conventional germicidal UV, which is here, there's a good dose response here, and for far UVC light, where basically you don't see anything in the, uh, any damage in the epidermis, and that's because all the light is absorbed in, in the stratum corneum. Uh, in vivo, well, uh, we're actually in the midst of a big study, and happily uh, our mice are still uh, um, um, alive and, and in the, uh, one of one of our facilities. So this is a six week, sixty week, uh, year, uh, eight fifteen month uh, exposure uh, study with a hundred hairless mice, uh, and they're being exposed to pretty high doses of far UVC light eight hours a day, uh, and we examine them every week or so for skin lesions and uh, give them eye exams. And we're about 38 weeks uh, into this study, um, doing different doses, males, females, uh, and we see no skin lesions and no eye damage at all as yet. So again, pretty encouraging. But again, that's what you expect purely on the basis of the physics. That this, is, this is a basically a physics-based approach that the far UVC light simply can't reach uh, living cells. So, those are the safety studies. Well, what about the efficacy studies? Well, we're primarily interested in, in uh, airborne uh, virus. So we set up this uh, apparatus. So we basically, we aerosolize uh, viruses on the left here, flow them through this exposure chamber here. And this is a, a, a far UVC light, which I turned around so that you can see it. It would normally be facing the exposure chamber. And then at the far end, we have a biosampler and we, and we assay how many uh, uh, viruses are, are alive or dead. And what you see on the right-hand side for uh, two of the seasonal um, uh, human uh, COVID viruses, um, an alpha virus and a beta virus, uh, that uh, they are actually very sensitive to, uh, to far UVC light. And we'd actually done this study uh, earlier with uh, H1N1 influenza and got pretty well the same results. So with very, very low exposures here, we're, we're getting uh, one, two, three, four logs of, of killing. So uh, yeah, it's certainly uh, effective in inactivating uh, aerosolized uh, uh, coronavirus. And the study that we were about to start, and we'd, we'd finally got all our IACUC approvals and so on, but uh, then uh, the, the COVID-19 hit, was to do a direct uh, uh, transmission study. This, this was gonna be with influenza, with H1N1, and jointly with, uh, with Mount Sinai. Uh, so basically we have two uh, cages which are uh, separated, but there is airflow in between them. We have a, a donor guinea pig, uh, which, we, uh, which we give influenza to, and then we have a recipient. David, uh, you are you have one minute left. Okay, I think I'm good. And then we have a recipient uh, guinea pig on the, on the left here, and we assay uh, whether or not that uh, gets influenza, both with lamp, without lamps, and, and with lamps. So uh, uh, that that is a direct uh, assay of whether the technique would work. So. In the near future, I mean, we see far UVC light uh, ubiquitous in occupied public spaces. And there are a couple of companies now that are ramping up uh, big time. And their claim is in six to nine months, they will be producing uh, many hundreds and thousands of these lamps, which can simply be installed where in public places in the same locations where the conventional lighting is overhead. 
So we can see it uh, certainly in public transportation systems, trains and planes and so on. We can see it in airports, which would be great for preventing pandemics. We see it in schools. Uh, uh, our original no notion was uh, preventing the uh, spread of measles in schools. But again, this approach would work for uh, works in, uh, concurrently for all viruses. So I, I, think, uh, I think there is a good future here. Um, we need to uh, get through uh, uh, the uh, FDA approval for this and we need to ramp up the uh, production of uh, lamps to, into the hundreds of thousands and the millions. So there I'll stop and I think my time is up and again, happy to answer any questions. Yes, we can hear you. Great, I was wondering how you're testing the damage to the eyes in the mice? Uh, well, they, they're being given eye exams every, well, initially it was every week and now they're being given uh, eye exams every two weeks and that's, that's with Norm Kleiman in, from the Eye Institute. So if you're interested, we also have an instrument where we can assess their cornea and retina, you know, in the future when we're out of this pandemic, that might be useful. And uh, we, uh, that, that would be great. Um, uh, the, the, there are clearly these two issues of the, the skin and the eye. Uh, we have great models for, for the skin. Um, uh, we could certainly do, do with more help in the eye, so thank you.